the RPA and uh, XFAR forces integrated after the uh, the 1994 uh, liberation uh, war after successfully dislodging the government that had committed genocide there was a general drive to integrate the XFAR forces who are quite a large number uh, i think they tripled the forces of the RPF the RPF had 12000 and the the FAL forces were about 36000 so it's triple so we were able to integrate many of them of course some fled to the DRC but the integration process was gradual as we you know dealt with the with the camps in in uh, DRC in 1996 97 we were able to bring more and in the subsequent years the integration continued some eventually went to the, you know different uh, they went to civilian life and were integrated in society um, but uh, generally the the process has been so systematic and it is it is still ongoing till today where we have Motobo rehabilitation center where people who have been involved in battle in uh, the Congo war uh, fighting against our government are brought in every other day uh, and are integrated in society so that uh, is a very important strategy it's part of reconciliation part of integration and it's part of the general transformation of our country. The first ideological difference between the RPA and uh, the XFAR was the ethnic ideological considerations. The XFAR, the FAR at the time, did not consider you know, a community, a certain specific community to be eligible to uh, join the forces. In our end, actually we integrated immediately as soon as the struggle began. Uh, we integrated not only at the military level, but even at the political level. We had to you know, pick a chairman from uh, a different ethnic group to break that stereotypic perception that you know, it is basically an ethnic battle. And this is what people thought it was all about. But the RPF, demystified that and uh, built a system that was based on uh, collective identity of Umunyarguand and not uh, based on ethnicity. So that is the ideological difference between uh, the XFAL and the RPA, which eventually became the RDF and, and the RPF uh, political party. I wouldn't say that Sende uh, significantly uh, played as a, as a, as an, as a allocation, uh, played uh, a very significant role in, in, in leading to the capture of the city. But say it was just important. It played one part of an overall uh, task that was carried out by a joint force of Alpha, which came from um, uh, Murindi, Bravo, five nine and several others one five seven so it was a combination of you know forces that supported the third battalion which was based here had it been alone left alone it would have been very difficult for them to prosecute this operation successfully so one can say it was a teamwork of different players uh, supporting sende uh, the forces in sende the 600 Well, at the time, when a host nation uh, does not provide the requisite uh, security for the public, then we no longer have a DMZ or any other zone that, that you can trust. So the RPF had to conduct operations to rescue uh, victims, including in the DMZ, because there was nothing secure about it. The UN had failed at its role. I think it's, it's, a, it's a fact. Uh, they, they could not, you know, successfully protect anybody from these areas. So DMZ or no DMZ, the RPF, RDF had, um, RPA had to conduct operations uh, throughout the country to be able to, uh, to rescue uh, the civilians who were in threat of being killed. <laughs> 
Music is one avenue, a very important avenue through which themes and messages can be passed on. And indeed, uh, it was best transmitted through, you know, song. And uh, the desire to, you know, go back to your country, uh, to, to songs had words like Rugwanda, uh, Rugamata uh, land of milk and honey, which basically painted a picture of what Rwanda looked like. And so all these songs uh, built unity, built uh, enthusiasm to fight. Uh, it actually worked on the psyche of, of the, the liberators, trying to get them to realize that this is something they need to fight for. And so songs were a good avenue of driving that message home. It has, quite, it has uh, influenced it quite a lot, in the sense that even today, uh, the music that we sing in our, you know, or the songs that we sing in our army, uh, I think you've heard of the cadet songs that, you know, picture, that present an image uh, of our force and how it's, it's built on unity and transformation and how the enemy who seeks to destroy our country uh, is going to waste, is basically wasting his time because uh, we are a united force, uh, a force for good. So these songs, the messages in the songs today mirror the songs that we had uh, in, during the liberation struggle. And indeed the struggle continues. So the songs send that message. The liberation uh, war that began in 1990 was as a result of uh, a refugee crisis that stems all the way from 1959, when a section of the community was you know, expelled from the country, the Tutsis were expelled to different parts of, of the region, especially in the East African region. Some were from Uganda, others from Burundi, Tanzania, Kenya, Zaire at the time, now DRC, and several other places. So these uh, refugees came together and organized the Rwanda Patriotic Front and its military wing, the Rwanda Patriotic Army, an armed wing of the RPF. So they invaded in 1990. After several attempts to come back home, negotiations to come back home, and the government at the time used a famous uh, saying that, you know, the, the, glass, the glass is full and we, we cannot accept more people. So that was the reason why RPA launched a struggle uh, in 1990. So in the initial period, there was a setback, and that was because of the joint uh, support that was offered to the government of, of Rwanda from France and, and Zaire at the time, and they were able to repulse the attack. Uh, but after that, the RPA reorganized under the leadership of the chairman high command, our current president, Paul Kagame, who at the time was in Fort Leavenworth. He was able to to come back and reorganize the force. And uh, the force was able to gain a foothold, what we call the centimeter along the borderline. With time, this foothold was expanded to include areas of uh, Biumba, Musanze. So this foothold expanded quite significantly. And therefore we brought the government of Rwanda to the negotiating table. And that is when uh, the Arusha peace accords uh, uh, began. During the peace accord, a group of extremists organized, to the contrary, a genocide against the Tutsis. And uh, in 1994, uh, after, of course, a number of incidences, uh, a genocide ensued in which one million people were killed. The commander-in-chief ordered the forces who were, who were in the negotiating uh, uh, for peace to forget about the peace and take up the um, task of rescuing uh, victims of genocide all over the country. So the force that was based here was ordered to break out and uh, to link up with other forces to stop a genocide and to defeat the genocidal forces. So that's what happened uh, in, during the liberation struggle. The liberation war had a dual purpose. 
uh, to halt genocidal killings, but also to defeat the genocidal force and uh, reinstate state authority and uh, normalcy in Rwanda. There was uh, definitely a very good impact politically. When the RPF, RPA took over, there was a general drive towards reuniting a broken society. And to do this, we had to take a number of political, economic and social decisions. Uh, the first decision that we made uh, was to develop uh, a government of national unity that you know, had all parties uh, involved. And we actually executed the Arusha agreement in which different parties were involved in the political discourse uh, of the country. And so that was the first step. In regard to rebuilding the country, we were shattered completely. Uh, we had to build from scratch. The RPF and RPA had to build from scratch. So uh, it had to develop institutions of governance, it had to put uh, different offices in place from scratch. So with time, we were able to build institutions. Uh, many of them were established after years using people actually coming from abroad. For instance, the first revenue authority boss was from a foreign country uh, because we had few experts. So we were able to build institutions from scratch. And then in regard to the social aspects, we had to reconcile a broken society by establishing different social measures. We abolished the identity card, uh, which was bringing divisions in society. So we began to project Dumunya Rwanda as the basis of our you know, social reconciliation. So it worked out because um, we demystified ethnic identity. And this has played a very significant part in our transformation journey. There are a number of lessons that uh, our experience can provide, both on the continent and, and beyond. Uh, the areas that we operate currently have conflict situations that tend to mirror what we experienced. So our experience, therefore, provides valuable uh, lessons for them. If you look at the case of uh, uh, Mozambique, for instance, where you have a group, uh, Ansal al Sunawa Jama, uh, an extremist group that uh, performed acts that are akin to what took place here, beheading and killing you know, people for no good reason, just because of their identity, their belief systems. Well, we can provide lessons for reconciliation. The RRDF has exchanged ideas with uh, our counterparts on how to integrate combatants who are involved in that uh, insurgency. The same applies to Central African Republic, Sudan, where you have you know, various groups fighting each other. So there are various lessons that we can you know, give to our, our counterparts, our friends and allies on how to manage complex situations.